um, a very warm welcome to our fifth session of um, tactics for agroecological transition. We've got a special setup today, which um, finally works. So that's really amazing. And we've got um, three incredible presentations lined up again for us. Um, yeah, and maybe without further ado, we will jump into um, into the contents um, because we've got uh, a lot lined up. Um, we're super happy to have with us Celia Martinez Mora and Pedro Macanas Valverde in Murcia, I believe, both of them, uh, from the um, campaign um, uh, for um, against the ecocide in the Mar, Mar Menor in Spain. They were from the Plataforma for el Mar Menor. Um, after them, just to quickly tell you, we are super thrilled to have Nabil Ahmed with us uh, from the Interpret uh, um, Forensic Research Agency. I don't know if that's uh, what, uh, what they call themselves, but you will <laughs> reintroduce yourself later, I'm sure. Um, talking about their kind of forensic research on ecocide and um, uh, and their work on a, um, on a project in the Amazon right now. And third up, we have Colectivo Epidemia uh, in Italy, um, Chiara, who will uh, speak about uh, their approach to co-research on ecocide. So we're super excited to have you all with us. Thanks so much for being with us. We would start off um, with the Plataforma por el Mar Menor. Um, both Celia and Pedro will speak briefly, and then we will have Nabil, and then we will have Chiara. So um, maybe I will just uh, hand the word over to, I don't know who of the two of you wants to start, Celia and Pedro, but thanks so much for being with us. And um, we will share, you just tell us how to share your presentation, when we should hit the button, and when we should change the image. Babla primero Celia. Okay, Celia goes first. Bueno. Well, pues para mí es un placer. For me, it's a pleasure to form part of this course. It's so well organized and so uh, integrative. We are going to talk, both Pedro and I, about what we've been doing about the Mar Menor. We want, we hope to be a worldwide point of reference because we also need help to protect and defend our lagoon. I don't want to talk very much because we have very limited amount of time. When you want to share the presentation, I'll do the first part and then Pedro will do the second. Bueno, pues empiezo porque ahora. Lo que me digáis, se me ha ido la otra pantalla, no veo nada. Okay, o sea, now I can't see anything. Entonces, uh, if you don't hear me or whatever, please wave your hands. So I'm going to get started. I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem and how we've reached the point that we're in, in order for everyone to understand the situation. Otherwise, if we don't understand what's happened, it's very difficult to understand the solutions. I'm going to start talking about what the Mar Menor is. In this photograph, you can see this little island on that side uh, where the small island is, is the Mediterranean Sea. And then there's this very fine ridge of land and the interior part of that's called the Mar Menor. It's enclosed, it's a lagoon enclosed by this 22 kilometer long uh, thread of land. It's connected to the Mediterranean through natural canals and some also artificial uh, uh, canals. The peculiarity of its ecosystem is that it's highly saline and has a, a higher temperature, which means that it has its own flora and fauna. What has happened here? We've gone from a healthy ecosystem and through greed and lack of environmental integrity to a sick ecosystem. As you can see in the satellite images, the, the little uh, white areas are uh, urban 
and the green ones are all uh, irrigated. Uh, these all use uh, chemical uh, fertilizers and pesticides, and when it rains, they all end up in the Mar Menor. The origin of all of this, all of these activities are human, whether because of the uh, crazy construction policies of the 1990s or the intensive agriculture activity, and then other actions of overdevelopment, like the creation of uh, artificial uh, beaches, the dredging of channels and canals, etc., and mining activity, which is presently inactive, but which uh, was never properly sealed up. The mines were not properly sealed. So what has happened? We've gone from a uh, oligotrophic uh, ecosystem to a eutrophic uh, ecosystem. The undersea uh, meadows have been reduced radically. There's been massive death of fauna. And at present, we have a massive production of algae because of the uh, eutrophic uh, eutrophication. This is due to the arrival of fertilizers from agricultural use. So we ask ourselves, a, an innovative agroecosystem tries to go from an extensive uh, dry land uh, agriculture with very little uh, economic uh, profits to a very intensive uh, agriculture based on irrigation and uh, synthetic fertilizers. We can see on the map on the bottom part, each of those little green dots uh, is from 2017. Those are each little dot represents a area under irrigation. We can see that over the years, the uh, from 1977 to uh, 2017, there's been a massive growth of this irrigated land. We can see the region of Murcia that is one of the most intensively uh, uh, contaminated, as you can see from the European report. We appear as a red dot on the map due to the intensity of nitrates present in all waters. So an innovative agroecosystem has to be based on the diversification, the boom of the 20th century of agro mechanization and uh, and and uh, synthetic fertilizers has to give way to other ways of production. Therefore, we have areas. We have the uh, presentation of regenerative permacultural and agroecological practices as well as precision agriculture, uh, looking at uh, nature-based uh, remediation measures. As if we're talking in economic terms, it's also important to close the circle and encourage a network of uh, commercialization based on local markets on uh, zero kilometer products, uh, developing uh, synergy between uh, sustainable ecosystems and local economies. How did we get to this point? Because it costs an enormous amount of public money to try to uh, recover from this environmental disaster. We, as citizens, as residents of this region, we decided that it was necessary to uh, to to focus on the identity of the Marmenard populations. So here, the role of the fourth power is key. We began to uh, study and and learn as citizens starting in 2015 to creating the uh, social platform called Pact for the Mar Menor, the pr principal objective of which was the defense and protection of the Mar Menor. 
Now you can pass to the next slide. This is important because we work without any kind of economic income. Our way of operating, we believe that capitalist development is has led us to this problem. We have to function without, uh, without an income. The first thing we did was uh, try to establish bridges between political parties, executive power, uh, innovative researchers, and our society. From there, we started to develop masses of uh, aware citizens, citizens aware of the issue, uh, talking, giving talks in schools, universities, uh, all kinds of social centers. Here we have pictures of our first two major demonstrations with the objective of protecting the Mar Menor. In Cartagena, uh, in October 2019, it was the largest uh, environmental demonstration in the history of Spain. We reached the European Parliament on three different occasions to ex talk about our problem and delegations have visited us and we have not seen effective solutions to the problem. In the most recent demonstration, all of the slow organizations, the logos of which you see at the bottom are organizations that have joined this cause. All of this in parallel has led to a historical accomplishment, which is the uh, allocation of the ILP, the Mar Menor, uh, which establishes the Mar Menor as a uh, legal person. I will begin my talk referring to what Celia said about the extractivism. What we have in the Mar Menor is extracting the fertility of the land with the consequence of putting poison into the sea. This leads the living things that inhabited this, uh, this, these waters, uh, and it's an absolute to the absolute destruction of the Mar Menor. This all arises out of the Green Revolution and the transfer that happened in the 1970s and 80s that led to intensive irrigation in our region. We went from having a dry land, uh, arid land agriculture to intensive uh, irrigation based uh, horticulture. A, a penal activity began starting in 2017. In 2016 was the, very, was the first massive uh, uh, algal algae uh, bloom in the Mar Menor that made this uh, these waters absolutely uninhabitable for their denizens. This is extractivism. It eats up the territory, the agriculture, the resources. Uh, 38 different uh, administrators of agricultural companies were tried, uh, responsible for an enormous, for 80% of the contamination. This has been going for some time. This reaches even the president of the uh, water management board for the region. This arose through the uh, desalination schemes between 2012 and 2018. In 2019, this bloom occurred again, uh, this time much worse in that at that time, there was a massive die out of, uh, caused by anoxia uh, with a massive die out of fish and crustaceans, which shocked merchant society and the world. As Celia said, as Celia said, there were demonstrations, and some of the politicians they didn't choose to take part. More and more collectives came together. 
and we saw that the legal protections of the Marmonard were insufficient. So we opted to fight for the legal personhood of the uh, Marmonard itself. In the town hall of Alcáceres, uh, it was approved. Uh, from there, it went to the regional parliament, but it was rejected there because the community said that it was not authorized. Uh, thereafter, on, uh, in July of 2020, it was presented in the Spanish parliament. We began collecting signatures in the midst of the pandemic. And then there was another massive Anaxia episode and the people of Morcia were deeply upset and concerned about what was ha happening in the Marmenard. It was clear that it was extremely serious. This brought together 6,300, uh, 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 over 600,000 signatures. It was approved in the Congress by an enormous majority the green dots are the senators that voted in favor. It was nearly unanimous. On October 3rd of 2022, this uh, initiative became uh, active, which recognized the legal personhood of the Marmenard. And this is the first European ecosystem to have a legal uh, personhood, making it a subject of rights. This helps us shift the anthropocentric point of view of law to an ecocentric one in which our future is linked to the future of the earth and for us also the Marmenard. We cannot continue accepting that this uh, extractivist agriculture So the Marmenard now has a series of rights which we must uh, defend and protect. The protection against risks or damage, the conservation of the species and habitats, and the restoration of the damage that has occurred. Any person can denounce. It will be given even a uh, ID card as a curious anecdote. This, there have been a committee, there have been committees of representatives and the in representation of uh, civil society and the promoters of the this initiative, representatives of the state and of the region. There's also a, a monitoring committee that includes agricultural representatives from uh, organic agriculture. The Ministry of Ecological Transition also has established a bureau for the Mar Menor, and there's a framework for priority actions to recover the Mar Menor, look, seeking real solutions based on nature itself to avoid the contamination. In this, we have to, so some of our uh, proposals include creating a uh, green ring around the Mar Menard uh, with wetlands to filter the waters. We've also participated in, as Celia mentioned, uh, the discussion about nitrates looking at the contamination in the Marmenard and uh, appearing before the European Parliament. So when we talk about solutions, here we're seeing strategies that are being we're trying to shift the attention from uh, the contamination by nitrates uh, produced by agro-extractivist uh, agriculture and also the uh, urban waste that ends up in the Mar Menor. Uh, 
the, the trying to distract from the role of agriculture. They're looking at the fourth power. It, since October of last year, the uh, re agriculture uh, representative of the region is still talking about this region as the garden of Europe. They're only talking about water and access to water and not at all about the nitrates. This article, the counselor talks about ecology and pretends to be even more uh, environmentalist than the environmentalists themselves. We are trying to assist the Marmenard to shift, to make a agroecological transition. This can occur in a uh, orderly way, such as we're trying to promote or in a chaotic way being promoted by the uh, Councilor for Agriculture in the region. That's the struggle that we're currently involved in. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Celia and Pedro, and thanks a lot, Maggie, also for the translation, as always. Um, incredible to hear about this campaign. Um, we'll have more time to talk about it later. Please, I think somebody put it in the chat already, put your questions or comments into the chat. We're going to be collecting them there and bringing them with us, with us into the groups later. Um, so just keep it coming, everybody. I think it's going to be really interesting also to talk about um, some of the similarities or possible differences um, between these different legal approaches to do with rights of nature, um, fighting to make ecocide a crime, um, and so on and so forth. Um, it's one of the things that I am interested uh, in hearing more from you all. Um, for now, I would pass the, the virtual mic to Nabil. Um, who um, yeah, who uh, will tell us about the work that they're doing with Interpret and um, who we might um, ask a little question at the end of his presentation about how some of this might apply to or what we might learn from this kind of forensic work in terms of imagining ways of documenting um, a kind of agri-ecocide or ways in which we can go about kind of gathering data and if that is something that sort of uh, uh, you know, mortals can also just uh, go and try to do if they see it happening next door, so to speak. Um, but first, over to you, Nabil, and thanks so much um, for being with us today. Yeah, thanks, Manuela. Hi, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much, and uh, it's uh, great to join you. And um, and uh, uh, thank you for the presentation before. Um, I think it was a uh, very um, uh, important that uh, we started to hear about uh, uh, struggles that are uh, very much coming out of a social movement or coming from a, a collective sort of agency, right, when talking about uh, environmental destruction uh, and so on. Um, but that's uh, 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 not uh, exactly what we do. Uh, so I think uh, perhaps this can be um, a, a uh, uh, sort of aligned, but a different uh, perspective. So, but they are related. Uh, how I suppose to begin with, uh, we are interested in something that is uh, common across uh, uh, struggles, not just only in the environmental field, but also this uh, um, concept of uh, human rights, um, which is uh, uh, around this idea that uh, when state uh, and corporations or militaries or uh, those in power commit violence, then how do you uh, hold them to account, right? So when there is uh, impunity uh, that arises from uh, state violence and corporate violence. So, of course, this is... Uh, has been the work of civil society for uh, ever since, uh, you know, crimes of the state, uh, whether military or political, began. Um, but uh, uh, we can also uh, respond to the contemporary conditions, right? So, uh, to give you an example, today 
we have access for better or worse to more data uh, for example uh, online social media and whatnot than ever before uh, I remember being together when I was part of uh, 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 when we started forensic architecture uh, a group that's based in goldsmiths uh, in the UK which uh, uh, sort of really pushed for the discipline of architecture, which for a long time was involved in only making buildings uh, to be very nice and uh, uh, social issues. But when this idea that architecture could also be used to promote, to to stop uh, or or put a lens up to um, uh, human rights violations, we had invited uh, the uh, Spanish uh, judge Baltazar Garçon to uh, speak at uh, our uh, exhibition, which we organized at the Haus der Kultur and der Welt in Berlin. And uh, Baltazar uh, said to us that day that uh, um, uh, for a very long time, uh, the work of forensics, which uh, always really belonged to uh, the police, or the juridical forces, right? And uh, uh, it was, uh, um, so uh, official forensics would be always collected by the by the police. So however, uh, what happens as, as being the, the, the authoritative source, right? Uh, but what happens when uh, um, uh, many people in the street take pictures of a crime committed by the police, whether this is, uh, uh, killing young black uh, 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 African Americans or young black uh, men in uh, the United the cities of U United States, or whether it's a bomb uh, attack by the um, uh, Israeli Defense Force on uh, on places like Gaza, or even the violence committed through uh, environmental means that happens from the destruction caused by mines or uh, deforestation and so on. Uh, so what if a lot of people are able to take pictures of this, you know, with their phones, which uh, have uh, metadata, so we know exactly where the pictures are taken, uh, which are a kind of standard that can be accepted even in legal contexts. Uh, what happens to evidence then, right? It is sort of uh, making evidence uh, somehow bottom up and, uh, um, and so on. Of course, there are groups uh, that are really professionalized these things, and the police. Uh, if you watch any police procedural TV show, you know uh, these things are common uh, today. But uh, we have a space now than ever before to uh, uh, collect um, facts, document things, uh, which may lead to being counted as evidence in a court, uh, and, and so on. So. Our work with interpret, you know, sits in this space between uh, environmental justice and human rights, right? So, uh, which are not the same thing necessarily, because, as we heard from our previous uh, presentation, right? There's a uh, nature has its own kind of agency, and uh, and uh, it can be an entity, but it also has its properties, right? If we can call it this, um, environmental destruction is not the same as a bullet going from a gun to someone's body. Right, it's much more diffused and uh, takes place uh, ecologically. It can take place uh, through uh, uh, in in ways that may not seem violent at all. Right, it may lack the intentionality. Uh, in a way, I was uh, in the beginning of the presentation before uh, we we sort of heard about this complex uh, uh, socio environmental situation where. Things were happening in the name of development, right? Which didn't seem like a, a intentional attack against the environment at all. Uh, however, there were uh, some uh, um, people involved, as we heard later, who were, for whatever motive, pro profit, or or uh, uh, or whatnot, were involved in in causing these some of these, which then somehow cascaded into the destruction of the ecosystem and so on, right? So. How do we hold uh, and better understand this evidence when it becomes like this, right? So, um, so, uh, so the work we do is uh, looking at these kinds of complex challenges, right? So uh, uh, we work in legal cases. Uh, we are since two years or three years um, 
uh, working in a legal case against the oil company Shell in the British courts in support of the of uh, communities in the uh, Niger Delta. In particular, uh, we've been working for many years with the movement for the survival of the Ogoni people. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is a kind of place and case that many people know about, Shell in the Niger Delta. But uh, I often tell my students and, and uh, I ask this rhetorical question, what do we really know, you know, about these places? Uh, you know, where are they located? What is exactly the, the cause and what exactly is being destroyed? What are the names of the places, you know, and so on, right? let alone actual stories from the ground, right? So uh, the work we have been doing is uh, 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 was to actually counter Shell's uh, official uh, uh, reports on a specific oil spill where we were able to use the uh, photos and videos taken by local people uh, about an oil spill and to basically reconstruct this uh, spill uh, and and which is being used against Shell in the legal case. So uh, uh, it is usually their word versus the people's word, but this time, this one particular time, out of the hundreds of oil spills that take place, the people had uh, some pictures that we could then, you know, piece together and show uh, uh, what happened. This uh, was specifically about a truck. Uh, according to Shell, there was no truck at the spill site. Uh, however, we uh, it, as if it just something that big had just disappeared into thin air. Uh, however, uh, the images and uh, that we collected was able to sort of show precisely, you know, where the truck came from, you know, where it was, uh, where it hit a certain pipeline, uh, you know, what was the spill and uh, and so on. However, the um, the material we had was not perfect, right? Uh, there were some blurry images. There were some uh, uh, camera angles that were difficult to uh, uh, really uh, figure out. You know which direction. You know with the 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 spill was moving, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, so we always have to also constantly you know uh, adapt and deal with these kinds of challenges, right? Uh, these representational challenges of environmental destruction. Uh, the causal challenges, but also evidentiary challenges, right, uh, uh, and so on. So, um, but we are also working uh, uh, in advocacy contexts uh, because law and the legal sort of space is only one, but one uh, avenue, right? Uh, the the law is hardly perfect, and uh, uh, hardly many things don't even go get to courts. But uh, sometimes the courts can be used as a as a tool, right? Uh, not only you know, you know, not the end in itself, uh, but uh, means to a bigger change, a social change, right? Uh, that uh, I think we all agree on what might that might look like. Um, so the advocacy cases we work on, for example, uh, have are been to uh, to present cases where. Um, uh, uh, cold cases, cases that had not been looked at for, for decades, right? Uh, for example, uh, we uh, uh, worked with journalists in France to um, reconstruct, again, to use this term uh, as, a, as a methodological term, maybe we can talk about this uh, uh, later on, but uh, to reconstruct a series of nuclear tests, right? Um, which uh, have something similar to environment, you know, that uh, they're difficult to, um, to, to, to track. But to reconstruct a series mm -hmm. of uh, nuclear tests which showed uh, um, uh, what uh, the impacts were and how the French government was, how, how they were lying to local people or in Mao Hinui. Um, mm -hmm. I'll very quickly in two minutes show you the, uh, a project that Manuela sort of mentioned uh, I don't know if you can all see the screen. So this was a, 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 a case that we have uh, recently completed, which now deals directly with ag agro uh, ecology and, and these concerns. Uh, this was a, a, a platform that we built um, for a legal case that was submitted to the, uh, the chief prosecutor's office of the International Criminal Court. Um, uh, and the filing parties were 
uh, a group of international criminal lawyers that we work very closely with, uh, and uh, uh, many organizations, uh, human rights organizations, environmental and grassroots organizations uh, in Brazil and, uh, and, and, and international ones too. Um, and the concept here, which I will, I will send a, a, a put a link to this so you can have a look at yourself. This is also in Portuguese for those of you who speak Portuguese. Um, but the case really has a, a, a very uh, a, 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 a narrative, right? Uh, all cases need a kind of narrative, and, and in this case, what we try to show, uh, following the, the the case, is that um, uh, the crimes against humanity, you know, to be precise, not just any crimes, but crimes against humanity, humanity that are recognized in the Rome Statute, the International Criminal Court are taking place or have been taking place for a long time in the uh, in the Amazonia uh, in, in, in Brazil, right? Um, and uh, this is taking place because uh, for, uh, uh, for a very long time, and certainly uh, in, our, in our case timeline, you know, uh, going back 10 to 15 years before Bolsonaro, uh, there was, there has been an, an, an effort, right, to increase uh, through corporate capture, uh, soya plantations, for example, um, uh, cattle ranching, uh, agri, agro industrial projects to um, take over land uh, that used to be sort of uh, more public land and, and in land which uh, uh, belong to indigenous peoples, but also other kinds of communities, right? So I won't go into too much detail here, but what one thing is important here to, to look at, right? Uh, if you follow the logic of the case. So our position, right, is was that, uh, um, you know, this level of, of violence, right, uh, of, of, you know, sort of a industrial scale uh, land grabbing and, and uh, economic profit, um, is is not possible by one company or one individual, right? Uh, it also reminded me a little bit to the previous presentation. Here, what, what we called a network was in place, the i.e. the ruralistas, for example, uh, as they're known, which combines uh, politicians, uh, police officers, high-ranking military uh, politicians and uh, and business people, right, who sort of work together uh, sometimes not necessarily almost like a mafia like fashion to to uh, to exploit these lands right and importantly uh, it is not possible without uh, uh, without actually harming people and without uh, without killing people without uh, taking people's land away without beating people without doing all committing all kinds of crimes which constitute crimes against humanity right um, so if you look here, uh, uh, and, and in fact, this intensified under Bolsonaro, but uh, it, Bolsonaro was neither the beginning nor the end point. He was, if only, a key player of the network, right? So um, here, for example, you can see in the state of Pará, uh, you know, the, the cattle ranching uh, and, and related uh, uh, activities like soya plantations uh, and deforestation and so on were you know, in the are, are are very high, right? So, what we then tried to do was how do we prove that this is crimes against humanity, right? Um, uh, so, what we try to do here is actually, um, sorry, this is uh, one step again. So, what we try to do here is then to um, uh, we were we worked together with the Com uh, Commissario Pastoral de Terra, the Pastoral Land Commission. Uh, who have for decades had been collecting uh, attacks on uh, um, uh, various, uh, you know, people. Uh, so Coilambolas, settlers, landless, squatters, indigenous peoples, fishermen, uh, and many others, right? Uh, and documenting this in a report. Uh, however, this report was not uh, uh, something that could be sort of turned into uh, data that we could uh, otherwise uh, be useful in, in a legal case such as this. So our, uh, so I want to sort of, for instance, um, I want to show you, for instance, here, let me pass through this very quickly. Uh, 
that uh, um, you know we we have all heard of the Amazon being uh, uh, the lungs of the planet and how it's being under threat. But this is an easy narrative for some uh, Western uh, environmentalists, right? For you know liberal environmentalists. Uh, however, you know this map of the Amazon shows a different picture. It shows actually people that uh, you know based on CPT's data that have been killed, tortured, you know assaulted, death threats against them that have been you know, uh, uh, the, the, there has been a tremendous level of violence, uh, evictions and others, if you notice, you know, intensified, for example, in the state of Pará. So uh, all of this data, right, became uh, the basis to, to, for the legal team to make uh, an argument that, uh, uh, you know, the, the destruction of the Amazon, you know, is possible through corporate capture and this corporate capture is possible, you know, through, you know, uh, through brute violence against people, right, uh, who are uh, victims and who are often um, without uh, any power. So the case um, then, uh, sorry? I will just have to ask you to wrap up quite soon, but we do have to break up breakout rooms um, to continue. Okay, yeah, I'll just get to the to the last point then. So we, we then also uh, uh, showed, uh, uh, gave uh, specific examples, right? Uh, the Pau Darko massacre, for example, was a, uh, and by the way, when we talked to people in Sao Paulo, you know, uh, you know, some of them had never heard of this, this, this massacre, even though, you know, uh, 10 or 12 uh, landless people were, were brutally killed by the police and that nothing happened to these people, right? So we used uh, uh, police uh, case files, but also, um, uh, interviewed, uh, 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 working with a photojournalist and, and people on the ground, uh, interviewed uh, the lawyers that represented some of the victims, survivors, uh, testimonies, and 3D modeling and uh, other kinds of tools to kind of reconstruct what happened as specific cases to, to, to show uh, in, the, in the case. So, um, and we you know, did this in three particular cases in the state of Para where our photojournalist colleague uh, went. So uh, in the end, I just want to come to this question of uh, what we call interest of justice, right? So uh, it comes back to the point, right? That there's a bigger story here, which is that uh, uh, the, the International Criminal Court should take this case up uh, it took them no time to start investigation in, in Ukraine, but uh, there are many other cases that are languishing in the prosecutor's desk uh, or, or his, uh, his, you know, his at the moment, you know, Steam's uh, desk, which do not get looked at, right? So, uh, the National Criminal Court, uh, you know, if it is to, you know, protect, you know, people and the planet should, uh, uh, should start at least looking at uh, a case like this uh, because it matters uh, not only to justice for the victims, right, uh, but also in a much global context around. Uh, but also that uh, um, that in this architecture of international law, there's a missing piece, which is the crime of ecocide. Uh, so up to now, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, uh, and crimes of aggression are recognized but not ecocide, which would extend, right, a kind of responsibility from an anthropocentric international criminal law to an, an ecocentric one, one, right, which would also look at uh, uh, destruction of the environment, not only in the context of war, which is enshrined today uh, in, in war crimes in the, uh, in the Rome Statute, but not uh, crimes committed um, uh, such as crimes against humanity, which doesn't need, need a conflict, right? Uh, it would also create a kind of moral and legal framework, right? Uh, it does not mean that ecocide then becomes, you know, a, a silver or a magic bullet. But, uh, uh, but, you know, of course, I want to go back to what I said before, this question of social movements and their work, you know, uh, you know it. You know this the justice at the level of climate or or uh, or otherwise does not uh, end or begin in the courts. So uh, thank you very much. And I can you know I didn't really get a chance to speak about like very specific sort of uh, uh, methods, but uh, I think maybe we can take that up. Uh, you know if anybody wishes to in uh, um, 
in a breakout room or, or, or later on. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nabil. Um, it's an incredible pleasure to have you all here today. Very exciting. I think it's amazing how these presentations fit together. We're um, running over time quite a lot, but I think it's also really great to just hear a bit more in depth. Um, and um, and it's also nice that we heard a little bit about um, your work, Nabil, um, with Interpret as a kind of approach to research that is in some sense also a co-research, I guess, since you work um, collectively and you also work with communities doing that, obviously, right? Um, and now um, our third presentation goes still more in depth um, on this aspect of research and co-research, which uh, we have discussed in previous sessions. The politics of, of research also to do with agroecology um, has been something we've discussed a little bit last time. So we thought it's really useful to go in depth with this in relation to ecocide in this session. So um, third up, we have um, the Colectivo Epidemia, um, which is a group of people. I mean, they're going to introduce themselves, obviously, but that are doing amazing co-research on the ground uh, on ecocide, in fact. Um, so Chiara will tell us, I think, about one specific case. Um, and again, um, we're going to go into the breakout room later to, to have kind of a more detailed discussion and hear more about maybe also some of the research that other people in the collective are doing. I think there's more, there's a few of you here also today, right, in, um, in this Zoom. So, um, so thanks a lot for being with us and uh, over to you, Chiara. Thank you so much, uh, Manu and Wue for this occasion to share uh, our um, experience as a collective and uh, the researchers. And thank you so much for the previous presentation because it was very amazing and super inspiring in a way. So yeah, uh, let's start. I just share on the chat um, like um, um, a peek to of Salento uh, to let you understand where uh, basically is in Italy. And um, okay. So yeah, um, just uh, um, uh, a presentation of what uh, collective epidemia is, because epidemia uh, means uh, epidemic in a way, and uh, the, the collective was born in, uh, in Salento, uh, which is in the very southest part of Apulia in South Italy uh, in 2018. So epidemia was born in Salento in 2018, and it started in um, uh, it starts as a collective to, to, to study uh, the socio-ecological consequences of Xylella in Apulia, which is this bacterium that almost dry up millions of olive trees uh, in, this, uh, in this area, but uh, we, we arrive it later. Um, so just a, um, um, a point uh, to let you understand how also the collective uh, that uh, started in Apulia, the research, um, then um, in the last year um, ev ev evolved in some ways um, because uh, uh, of the entry of new members and new field works, personal researches and methodologies and disciplines. And, uh, and now the collective uh, is also a space for sharing, a space also of reproduction and care, not without difficulties, especially when the collective stance relates with the individualistic demands and challenges that the academy uh, poses because um, all, of our, all of us are um, not just um, uh, activists, but also um, researchers in the academy. So um, here we choose to bring Salento once again, um, but uh, at the moment it is important to point out that it is not the only fieldwork of uh, the collective. So the um, Salento, um, which I, uh, I told you is the uh, most southerly geographic area of the Apulian Peninsula, is mostly flat and uh, where uh, the predominant crop is the olive trees. What we are talking about is basically a wide and very ancient plantation, like a giant monoculture. 
Uh, in the last 10 years, the entire area has been devastated by a plant epidemic due to this bacterium called uh, Xylella fastidiosa, which has essentially dried up most of the olive trees in a context where soil deterioration, desertification, salinization of surface waters, and abandonment were already undermining the ecosystem health of the environment. And today we are essentially witnessing the hampering of the olive grow landscape because one, uh, the eradication of the olive trees is the only legally viable way to treat trees affected by the bacterium. And the uh, second one, uh, if, uh, if uh, uprooting, so the process of eradication then does not take place, the trees end up burning, in, especially in the summer, given the very high temperatures and uh, um, because also the problem of arson. So basically people um, uh, let, the, let the tree uh, fire um, voluntarily. So what happens in this empty space? And so what Salento talks about, uh, talk us about um, transitions, uh, just transition, agroecological transitions, and what uh, we, can, we can see uh, in a critical way, um, in a critical perspective about uh, the um, strategy uh, that, take, that takes place in Salento to uh, move beyond this, uh, this critical point, critical uh, moment. Uh, so I just want to share you now a video just to um, let, you, let you see what, uh, uh, what is uh, basically happening. Um, so I try... Um, Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so what what is um, um, what is happening? The eradication of plants that um, sometimes they are still alive, um, and uh, um, in addition to the plant, the, the fact that the uh, uprooting itself destroys. Uh, ecological niches uh, that the roots have allowed it to be created and uh, undermines the soil absorptives and the draining capacity. The point is how far this commodification of uh, ecosystem services goes and where um, the valorization of biomass that could be just left uh, um, for no, on the land for nurture the soil uh, is uh, is pushed to because this uh, giant biomass of dry uh, olive trees are transported uh, for energy production. Uh, so uh, basically, individually see that uh, dry olive trees are eradicated. Uh, mixed up and uh, uh, transported uh, to um, central uh, biomass um, um, energy central in uh, in different parts of Italy, especially in Sicily and in Calabria, uh, to of course produce uh, uh, green energy. Uh, the point is, most of the time, uh, um, uh, biomass uh, centrals are also polluting, and there is no clear uh, also uh, process in this uh, transportation because of uh, sometimes mafia infiltration. Uh, so uh, biomass that could be just uh, uh, left for uh, the, a process of uh, um, ecological reparation in a way in the soil, uh, is commodified and uh, um, um, and yeah, uh, extractive in a way uh, and valorized in uh, in, a, in a capitalistic way. So um, this is uh, uh, the point I, I we want to share with you. And um, finally, talking about how to go beyond this agroecocide, um, we uh, start from a, um, a point of view that uh, research, in a way, um, worked uh, uh, with social movements in Salento. So. For, for me, for example, I worked the last four years with different um, organizations, and uh, um, I feel I want to bring a critical reading of... 
Just go on. I think that was Celia's mic that is open. But... Um, yeah, uh, to, um, um, a, a critical reading of this uh, definitive uh, value alternative practices, not so much to feed the future with uh, pessimism, but to open up a debate, uh, which I hope will take place during uh, this meeting on forms of coordination, alliances, and social and environmental justice. So I decided to present this standpoint, especially because uh, I know how many uh, great associations ex exist in Salento based on commons, agroecology and so on. But the most common question I heard in the last years um, is, OK, but why aren't we able to do things together and to have a massive impact uh, in the uh, in the area? So I just shared three, just three points to open up the debate. The first one is that in various forms of resistance, reconstruction, transition, there is a common background of alternative ways of valorizing, but a substantial lack of tools to ally, to agree even in diversity, or to coordinate other uh, re reproductive strategies and to shape an alternative that is not just localized micro practices that often confuse problem and the issue understood as the relationship between the personal and the collective with the, which is what is the collective just the village just the organization salento or apulia or the world in a way um moreover the two point is that uh, another problem I see is the confusion between justice and rightness. And this confusion, I think, is um, more understandable in Italian, because in Italy we have the uh, same question to define justice and righteous, which is giusto. Um, th this is one thing to move for a just transition. Another is to believe that you are doing the only right way to do it because this perspective does not help a long-term recomposition that includes a lasting alliance and the creation of a political subject, because every organization thinks to do the right thing to do a just transition. And, and the possibility of taking in and interjecting into these practices, those who are to the moment think differently. So um, basically uh, it begins to the creation of a dichotomy between right and wrong and the creation of an enemy, which sometimes is just a peasant that have not the, the same like sociological imagination to, uh, to think differently, no? And third point, finally, another problem I see in these practices, besides the self-exploitation they undergo in the name of being on the right side, is related to the issue of work, income, legal form. I try to explain uh, those who return to the land and make agricultural labor often uh, support the side this uh, like economically through calls, fundings and grants, which affects the sub uh, substantially uh, reproductive labor, written then uh, um, the actual agricultural one. So because they choose the um, uh, associative form, uh, rather than the cooperative form. Um, and so uh, sometimes the redistribution of funds. Fee. So this confusion between the third sector, you know, like cultural production through agricultural labor and agricultural work uh, in itself, on the one hand moves a lot of reproductive caring social work but on the other hand it keeps the scale of this experience changed because uh, which them because they don't in some way go from the dimension of local agri-food chains so uh, basically um i i don't want to critique the uh, strategies that are based in Salento, like um, based on commons and agroecology, but I want to put it critically because I, as a researcher that, uh, that uh, I, I've been lived in Salento last four years, uh, and I don't see difference anymore 
between my research and my uh, my life with this organization, I just want to to to, to actually see um, uh, a change, you know. And uh, and the problem for me is how uh, help um, from its point of view uh, a very change in this uh, uh, in this uh, field work. Uh, and so these uh, these are just the the three points uh, we we want to share with you like collettivo uh, and then yeah that's it thank you <laughs>